Welcome, everybody. My name is Joe Piprocki. I'm the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press in Chicago, Illinois. And it is my pleasure uh, today to be with you as the host and MC of Braving the Thin Places, a webinar with my good friend Julianne Stans, who I'll be introducing to you in a second. In the meantime, you can see her, her face on the side of the screen as she smiles and sips her cup of Irish tea, uh, getting ready to, to join in. But thank you all. We have literally people from all over the world uh, who are live with us uh, during this uh, webinar experience. And we're so thrilled to have uh, an opportunity to bring uh, Julianne's message to, to so many people at, the, at a time that it is needed uh, so dearly as well. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Julianne. And uh, I know this is the part that uh, I embarrass her as she has to stand by while I talk about her. Uh, and I have to tell you that this is her shortened, this is our shortened version of her biography because there's so much to tell. I'm going to start with the last line because it's like we throw that in like it's something extra you do. You're married and have three children. Let's start there. Julianne is married and has three children, and that is the center of her life. Uh, in addition to that, she is Director of Discipleship and Parish Life for the Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, and is consultant to the USCCB Committee on Catechesis and Evangelization. Julianne received her master's degree in religion and education from Mater Dei Institute of Education in Dublin and has been working on a PhD. Julianne is the author of Start With Jesus, How Everyday Disciples Will Renew the Church. She's also the co-author of The Catechist Backpack, Spiritual Essentials for the Journey from Loyola Press, and I was privileged to be her co-author on that. And so, uh, Julianne, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you so much. As we say in Ireland, dia gritch and falta roach, which means... Um, Hello, God be with you, and 100,000 welcomes to all those who are watching today from all over the world. Oh, I love it. And you've got a few uh, Gaelic phrases for us today, including uh, something during the, the middle part and something at the end. Uh, but uh, I love that greeting, 100,000 welcomes. And, and it looks like we're all set. Both of us have our, our cups of uh, tea with us, right? Um, I'm wearing my uh, green shirt and I've got my uh, little Celtic cross behind and uh, a poster of your, your book. You've got a Celtic cross on the wall and green furniture. Oh my goodness, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the book that we're drawing from today and that we're talking about, Braving the Thin Places, Celtic Wisdom to Create a Space for Grace. So. Drawing on her Irish Celtic heritage, Julianne helps us to explore those times and holy places of transformation. We're going to talk in a second about what thin places really means. Inspired by faith and guided by spiritual practices, we can experience each thin place as a point of departure on a sacred journey to a truer understanding of who we are meant to be. Uh, just to point out that we have a QR code on the screen there. If you are uh, in a hurry to order her book, you can go ahead and scan that QR code right now. And it'll, at least you'll have that in, on your phone uh, so that you can uh, go later on and not miss anything that Julianne is saying right now. But uh, Julianne, this, uh, this book you've told me is um, very personal to you. Give us a little backstory on you know, why it's so personal and why it, you said yeah, it, it took you 20 years to, to write. Yeah. Um, so I came to the U.S. in 2001, actually, and I used to keep a little pink notebook in my bag, making notes of all of the um, little pieces of spiritual wisdom, little snippets of um, my prayer life from home that I was drawing on. And so I had, I grew up in a part of Ireland um, that is so beautiful, right in the Wicklow Mountain area. And the southeast and the east of Ireland have a lot of historic sites associated with very, very sacred um, places in Celtic tradition. And so kind of that permeated my entire life. Um, and I didn't realize how lucky I was until unfortunately I left Ireland and came here and thought I was drawing on so many of those practices 
um, as I went along in my journey of faith here. And I wanted to share those with others, especially a lot of people say to me, but I'm not Irish. And I'll say, that's okay. <laughs> you know, these, the, the traditions, the practices, the insights that I wanted to share are universal. And, you know, some of them have been lost a little bit or de-emphasized and I wanted to bring them back. So it's like seeing a little part of my heart walking out in the world, Joe. Oh, that's wonderful. And and your heart uh, does uh, show and come through in this. So a beautiful book, very inspiring. And and I think it's very timely, too. Can you speak to that, Julianne, that we're at a time we're going through very difficult times with the pandemic and so on, but also, you know, the, the notion that many people feel disaffiliated from church and so on. And this is not a very churchy book, so to speak. You're, you're, it's a spiritual book and, and you draw on your on church tradition and so on, but you're not you're not hitting people over the head with churchiness. Uh, uh, was that on purpose? What are what are you trying to do with this uh, you know, reaching people on a, on a spiritual level you know one of the 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 insights that came from my background and my ancestry and my heritage is this idea of a deep and rich and noble simplicity that really can help you develop practices around spiritual resilience and prayer and peacefulness and let's face it who doesn't want to be more at peace today who doesn't want things to slow down just a little bit and so these are very unifying principles and i think they help us to kind of rise above some of the division um the fear the frustration that people are feeling today i think we've gone through a very thick time a time when conversation feels harder when um, people are mistrustful of all kinds of institutions today and so i wanted to be able to put something in someone's hands and um, no matter what they were going through, no matter what their faith background, or perhaps they didn't have a faith life um, that they were aware of, to be able to kind of be a bridge to knit some of those facets together for people. Yeah, so you're drawing on ancient wisdom for a very contemporary time, and, and uh, I think that's... Um, uh, always wise to do, but it's also a part of our, our Catholic heritage is that we draw on our tradition um, and not, you know, we try not to live in the past, but to reach into the past and bring it, you know, the wisdom from uh, times gone by into and apply them to contemporary situations. And I, I think you do a beautiful job of that throughout this, this book of you know, not just not dwelling in the past, but dealing with current situations. And, and that's why I wanted to start off uh, your bio by saying you're married and have three children. You're living the real life, Julianne. I, I think it's important that people know that you're not in some ivory tower somewhere. You know, you've got, you're holding down a full-time job. You've got three kids, uh, beautiful kids, but uh, their ages are a handful. Yeah. Uh, any kids that age are a handful. And so, you know, uh, you keep it real. Uh, is that something that that resonates with, you know, how, how you feel about, you know, what it is that you're sharing? Yeah, you know, I wanted to give people an authentic sense of, um, of just their worth and how loved they are and um, how no matter what they go through in life, um, that there is a meaning to, to those experiences of suffering or joy. And um, I, I do feel like I'm a person who keeps things real. Um, you know, the Irish are, are known for, for talking and, you know, bantering a lot. And my husband yeah. often says to me, if, if the Irish had an Olympic sport for talking, my wife would be the captain of the team. <laughs> a gold um, medalist all the yeah, way. <laughs> a gold medalist. But um, I often find sometimes that our conversations about faith um, can be kind of sanitized. And I didn't want to just, you know, string together a bunch of glory stories. I call them like, I once was lost and now my life is perfect because I think it's in the breaking open of some of the most amazing places in our life and also places of real suffering that the greatest growth occurs. And I think that's why uh, you told me on many an occasion that this book was very personal and it really is. And we appreciate that, Julianne, as I read through the book uh, several times already now. And, you know, so many parts are, are just beautiful stories, uh, real life stories, and, and they are very touching. And uh, so you'll be uh, touching on a few of them as we go through our conversation. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how the book is put together. There's 11 chapters in total. Um, but after an introduction, Julianne uh, divided the book into four places, four parts. And we're going to look at those uh, during our time together here. And then we'll have time at the end for some Q&A. 
uh, with Julianne by uh, encouraging you folks to use the chat feature. And uh, a couple of times, uh, Julianne may actually stop and ask you to just uh, put some thoughts in the chat as well. She likes to, she loves audience participation. And so there's no stopping her, you know? So if she just says, all right, everyone go to chat and put something in. Uh, I'm gonna step aside and let her do that. But part one is called entering in. Part two is cross, crossing the threshold. Part three, breaking free. And part four, coming full circle. And so let's uh, get into this notion, first of all, Julianne, thin places. Um, what's that all about? And are, 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 what are you referring to? And why is this a notion that uh, is something that people today should know about? We just talked about how muddy and bogged down life seems. You know, even the last couple of years, we know life has changed. Healthcare has changed, education has changed, conversations with our families haven't always been easy during this time. And I said, it's kind of a thick time. And I think God prepares um, us for thin times, um, especially when we go through times like this. And so I reflected back on this beautiful concept of the thin places. Um, it's, it's part of Celtic wisdom, um, but it really looks at the places in our lives that are um, broken open and where the veil between God and us uh, becomes very real. And so you can experience thin moments, uh, if you will. Uh, thin moments like um, maybe you get a, a reminder of a loved one who's passed away, like a penny from heaven or a cardinal or a feather. You know, a lot of people will say um, those are just coincidences, but I believe that is how God is trying to get our attention. So what's interesting is while thin places were always associated with um, historic places in Ireland, like Glendalough in County Wicklow, which is very near and dear to my heart. I go very close to here. I spent a lot of time there as a child. And um, Glendalough was always a source of prayer and inspiration and just a place where people could find themselves. And these sacred spaces um, really speak to people in ways that are very profound. But what I realize is we don't just have to go to places in Ireland or Scotland or Wales or wherever, but thin places are spaces where God can meet us in the everyday moments of our lives so that he can um, help us become more attuned to how he is moving in these experiences of our life. That's an important thing, Julianne, and I was, I was just about to interrupt you to ask you this. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I've never had the privilege of going to Ireland. I'm not sure that I ever will. Uh, do I have to go to some exotic place? I live on the south side of Chicago. It's not a very exotic place. Uh, where are thin places? How am I going to experience thin places in my mundane setting? You know, we talked about this a little earlier, but one of my, I grew up and I listened to the music of Andrea Pacelli. I love his music. And my husband surprised me with tickets a couple of years ago um, when he was performing at the United Center, which is this massive arena, thousands and thousands of people. And he stepped on stage, I'll never forget the moment, and he was singing and there was some beautiful artwork behind him and I started to cry. And my husband said to me, what's happening? And I was really struggling to um, share why I was so overwhelmed. And he just put his arm around me. He said, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? And that's, I think we can have these thin moments in our lives where we feel time moves differently and the supernatural breaks into the natural world in a way that we don't expect and overrides our emotions so that our heart just feels, fills the capacity um, with love, with awe, with wonder. And so you can have these thin place moments in your average, ordinary, everyday life. Uh, I like the way you uh, use the word moments then as, as well, that thin place moments, that because of a moment, a place becomes thin. Uh, and, and it becomes for us, you know, something that we recall uh, experiencing that nearness of God. And maybe just one other thing to, to clear up, you're not suggesting that, that these are places where, you know, God is waiting, but uh, he's hiding everywhere else. Um, is, is our thin places reminders that God is near all the time? Or is that overstating it? No, I think it is. You know, um, when my, my grandmother passed away, her name was, we called her Nanny. Um, she had on her a little obituary card, uh, you have gone no further from us than to God and God is very near. 
And so this idea of the nearness of God carrying us through these moments, leaving footprints in our lives in ways that we can't always see, that is a very, very Celtic understanding of the nearness of God and how close he is to us through people, through experiences, um, but in very profound ways. So this uh, Celtic spirituality, and I'm going to ask you in a moment to tell us what Celtic is all about, it is, uh, sounds to me very Ignatian, you know, working for Loyola Press, we are always um, reinforcing the notion of finding God in all things. And it, it seems to me that this Celtic spirituality is, is doing the same thing. So in a sense, St. Patrick uh, and Celtic spirituality are, uh, have a, an Ignatian streak in them. Is that uh, true? Absolutely. And I love that finding God in all things, finding God in all people finding God in all places. I think one of the great gifts of Celtic spirituality is to be able to look with the eyes of faith on the world and see deeper meaning for us. You know, when we use the term Celtic, I should clear this up right away, we're talking about a group of languages and nations that spread out from about the center of Europe in all different directions. Today, the word Celtic most um, closely is associated with um, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, Devon and Cornwall in England, Nova Scotia and Brittany, and also a little um, Isle of Man, it's the little Isle of Man between England and Ireland, where I used to holiday as a child. And while other cultures certainly have um, benefited, have um, harmonized some of those practices, when we talk about the Celtic nations, those are the countries that we're most referring to, but it's very accessible um, because so many of us emigrated like myself, you know, 50 million Americans claim Irish ancestry. That's not, that's not including Irish or, or pardon me, Scottish or Welsh. Um, this tradition has, has just woven its pathway throughout the world. Well, and that, I appreciate that background on it because, you know, here in the United States, we, you know, uh, we have a team called the Boston Celtics. Celtics. We don't even say the name right, you know, so Celtic is, is uh, dealing with uh, geography, it's dealing with spirituality, it's dealing with uh, some ethnicity to a certain point. So it's a, it's a very uh, complex term, um, but you're using that to sort of bring together many of the thoughts that, that you're sharing in this book. Absolutely. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what those thin place, place moments can be and if they can be joyful or those of suffering. I see some questions coming in, so feel free to keep those coming in for us and we'll get to those as well. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Use the chat to put questions in and we're going to make sure we save some time at the end for some Q&A. But let's jump into part one. And uh, in, in uh, part one, Julianne titled this part, Entering In, and she quotes Ernest Hemingway from A Farewell to Arms, the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. Julianne, you alluded just a moment ago to this notion of, of brokenness, that thin places are, are not always, you know, oh, moments where, you know, just extreme joy and glory, but sometimes there are moments of, of, uh, of brokenness and maybe even re reaching rock bottom and uh, uh, coming into a realization. So tell us about this notion of brokenness and, and why this is such an important part of spirituality. Yeah, I, in fact, one of the earlier titles for the book was around that theme of breaking open. I think sometimes in life um, we can fall apart or we can look back on that time in our life when we can realize that it was breaking apart so that uh, God could do something even more beautiful in and through those moments. So I think, I think back to times in my life when I've undergone a lot of suffering or loss, or I've been really grieving people in my life who've passed away. And it, it may feel like you're falling apart in those moments, but keeping faith at the center of that conversation and dialoguing with your own suffering means that when you come out of it a little later, you're able to reflect back on those times and see those broken places as times when God knit you and knit you back together in ways that you would never experience, often left you more peaceful, more hopeful, something that I think suffering always brings growth. Um, and I realized that in my own suffering and walking with those who are suffering, suffering um, helps us be more compassionate toward everybody. Um, and so I, I don't want to discount those joyful moments because they're really, really important. And, um, but being able to discern um, how God is moving is, is so important. I want to encourage folks in the chat bar to um, please share with me your thin 
place moments, if you've had those, whether it's a place you've gone to and you've really entered into the spirit of that, or if it's just um, a moment that came to you. So feel free to share those. I'd love to hear them. Yeah, please do. And uh, as soon as you start seeing some uh, pop up there, Julianne, feel free to, to comment on them. Um, I was going to mention that, um, so this notion of suffering, just the other day, I heard that uh, Billy Joel song, Only the Good Die Young, where he, he doesn't talk very kindly about Catholics in there. And uh, of course, he refers to, uh, you know, the sinners have much more fun and that, you know, there's two Catholics are too hung up on suffering and so on. Obviously, um, he, he doesn't get the fact that we're not dwelling on suffering, but recognizing that in suffering that God found a way to break through mm -hmm. to us that we don't like being miserable, but in the moments of suffering, uh, that's where God can be found. Um, I don't think our culture really suggests that to people. No, I think too, do we have this kind of fittest you know, survivalist mentality around the race to be strong and successful and all of that, this Pinterest kind of culture we live in where everything is perfect and lovely. But some of the most beautiful people that I have ever met, their lives have been transfigured by suffering because they've been able to bring that suffering to the cross and find meaning in the suffering. And I wanted to be able to share through the book some wisdom um, around uh, those thin places in these shanokles, we call them, which are wise words. One of my favorite shadow, shanokles is we live in the shadow of each other. A Scott Akela Awar Nadini. And it's basically that as we face into the light, we throw a shadow. And in that shadow may be somebody who can't face the light because it hurts like bright sunshine. And so we become a soft place for them to embrace whatever they're going through. And when they're ready, we can step over and um, make a way for them. I'm also seeing a lot of really great thin place moments coming in through the chat box. You want to mention some, Julianne? Yeah, I do. Uh, visiting a fort in Uganda was very significant for Laura. A lot of people are mentioning the Camino. There's um, quite a few folks who are mentioning um, a loved one who's passed on, like mom who's passed on who loved the hymn Ave Maria. Um, I, this is a beautiful one too. The first time I received the Eucharist after the COVID shutdown, mm. um, being present when a loved one um, was making their way home, traveling to be with my mother at the end of her life. So there's some really beautiful, I'll be saving these in the chat bar um, so because I want to read through them later as well. That's beautiful. Thank you, folks, for, for sharing. And uh, thank you, Julianne, for sharing some of them with us now. So you mentioned this notion of the living in the shadow of, uh, of each other. And I, as I first read that, I think I misunderstood because in, in my notion of being the seventh out of nine children, I lived in the shadow of uh, my older siblings. And that's not always you know, thought of as a good thing that I had to break out of their shadow. But you're suggesting more of what we hear in the Acts of the Apostles when it tells us that the, the people would carry the sick out to the street so that when Peter would walk by, his shadow would fall, even, even his shadow would fall on him, on them. And so it's this notion of that, you know, somehow touching each other's lives in this very mysterious way. Tell us more about this notion of uh, our shadow living in the shadow of each other. Yeah, I think there's a drive today to be, you know, we're, we're strong, we're healthy, we're independent, but we're very interconnected as a people. What we do affects the whole. And I think we've learned in the last couple of years just how important it is to recognize our connectedness um, with, you know, within our communities, within our families, and in our homes. And also on the flip side of that, when that breaks down, how painful it is for so many of us. And I'm looking at, as the chat bar comes in, there's so many comments coming in around places of meaning and people are saying you know i never realized i never connected like the little you know the cardinal in the window mm. to that being god trying to break through into the ordinary everyday moments of our lives to to help us attune to his presence and so um these shanokles these um these they connect us i think more deeply to our ancestors but also to each other and you suggest that when we uh, encounter these moments, these thin moments, that we, we find ourselves asking questions, that, that we're asking questions about ourselves and about life and about God. Um, why, why does that happen? Why are these moments, why do we start asking, is this all or who am I? And, and, and how do we um, 
how do we search for answers to those questions? No, and this is such an interesting thing because nobody can answer the question of who you are called to be except yourself. Mm. And so uh, we're asked a lot of times in life to do things and we do them out of a sense of love, sometimes out of duty or habit. But the question of who we are is such an important one. So for, for the Celts, it was always who you were was answered in relationship to your family, where you lived, all of those important places. So for example, the, the word mock or muck, um, like MacDonald or um, McMurray, mock meant son and me, so my name in Gaelic is Siobhan Onion Donlun, which is Julianne, daughter of Donlun. So who we are is always configured in relationship to someone else. And I think for many people, we focus so much on who we're configured to hear, but I think ultimately we have to ask, you know, who is God calling us to be and who we are in relation to him? And I remember asking this question at a conference maybe 10 years ago, and a woman came up to me. She was 86 years of age, and she said, you asked a question, who am I? And I couldn't answer that today. And I happened to see her a year later, and she said to me, I answered that for myself. And I said, what was your answer? And she said, I am gift. That's how she answered it. So I'd love to see in the chat bar how you would answer that question. Who are you? So get those uh, comments coming in and we'll share a few of those as well. I love that. And, and it's, a, it's something that a spiritual director would, would do um, to ask, you know, so, so who are you? And then when you answer, they said, no, no, really, who are you? And they keep on probing a little deeper, right? You know, I'm Joe. No, no, who are you? Well, I'm Joe from Chicago. No, 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 no. Who are you? Well, I'm Joe from Chicago who works for Loyola Press. You know, we keep going deeper and deeper into the essence of, of who we are. Um, so what are you saying? Are folks uh, answering the, the who are you question, Julian? Yeah, that's that's, I one. would take a little while to think about that myself. Yeah, that's a big deep one. And it took me, like I say, 20 years. But things like I am a lover, a, a beloved and forgiven daughter of God. Mm. I'm a daughter of the king. I'm the beloved daughter of God, a beloved child of God, a relater. I love that a story there. I'm God's servant. I'm a child and servant of the Lord. I'm his child, his beloved. I'm a channel of God's grace to others. Uh, probably the most difficult question to answer, said someone. I am yeah. strength. I am hospitality. I am trying. Thank you for being real there. I really appreciate that. So there's a lot of, I'm a seeker. I am precious. There's some beautiful, beautiful comments coming in here. I'm God's lamb. I'm a broken mom who lost her son eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm a wee stitch in God's quilt. Um, oh, I love it. We got some real poets here. Yeah, I'm a beautiful mess. I love it. <laughs> And that's what I was hoping for, is that people would bring their whole and real selves into this thin space for us today to be able to tap into this conversation, because thin spaces are always bridges for us, Joel. This is one of my favorite bridges at home. Yeah, but tell us about this notion of bridges and thresholds and portals and doorways. You, you have pictures. I'm going to show a few more as we go along of some doorways and yeah. thresholds. And part two is all about thresholds. It is. Yeah. And we're going to get to that a little bit. But what I wanted to help people understand is the bridge to what you're living and into where God is calling you to be is a very thin place. When someone shares their story, when 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 you have put into the chat bar some of the the, the, the comments, the stories of your own suffering, losing loved ones, a son who died in a car accident, you know, that is a thin space right now for me, for us to receive yeah. what you're telling us. Story is always the ground of thin place and thin space. And so bridging those um, is an important part in Celtic spirituality of how we can actually help others uh, bridge their own story and cultivate their own soul story, which we're going to talk about a little later as well. But, you know, as you were talking, Julianne, it made me think of my spiritual director, Maureen, as you know, she just passed away. and um, and it occurs to me that, you know, other people do help us uh, answer the question of who we are. And every time I met with her, so once a month over 20 years, she would begin with a prayer, just spontaneous. She would just talk to God. And, and she would always, you know, after she'd pray for lots of needs of the world, she goes, and uh, especially today, pray for Joe. And she'd pause and she would always say, he is your precious one. Aww. And it's just, you know, ev to hear that every month, I mean, I don't go around thinking I'm God's precious one, but to have someone else say that, you know, brought me into a, a thin space once a month. So we really have the power to create thin spaces for others, don't we? 
Yeah, we have the power to create thin space um, for our children, for our family members, uh, for all people. And also if you're called to minister uh, to, to people, um, you have to recognize that this is kind of a pilgrim journey that we're all on. And I think life, we know life has changed through this pandemic time. And um, I, I don't wanna talk about that. I wanna focus on what's good, but I think we all know things have changed and we're not quite sure what and how. We know we have changed. The people that went into this period of time came out very different. And this is a pilgrimage time. And I think Thin Space invites us to pilgrimage to places in our own life so that we can help others to go to those places where they might avoid or they're afraid um, or they're afraid to ask what it means to, to um, unpack their suffering or their joy. Um, and so I think we can be conduits for this. This is a fun slide here. It's from Crow Patrick, where St. Patrick spent, spent 40 days and 40 nights in prayer. There's a great little story in the book about St. Patrick and learning from him around, don't be afraid to go to these places in your life. I mean, I had been for a long time um, and part of why I wanted to write the book was to encourage you to share those thin spaces with others and don't just hold them back. Um, because I think the world is better when we share more authentically from our hearts and bring our whole self into the conversation. And it occurs to me too, you know, we talk about mountaintop experiences as though being on the mountaintop, we see everything very clearly. Uh, there's clouds at that mountaintop. I love this picture. When we get to that mountaintop, it's an experience of mystery that we enter into, but it's not like we see crystal clearer, but, but we have a sense that we are in, in the midst of something bigger than ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I love this Irish expression, we're betwixt and between. Betwixt and between. Yeah, and that's what thresholds are, thresholds of growth. I mean, here's this is me at the bottom of the mountain, but if you had seen me when I got to the top, you would see a very, very different character, tired, worn, mm. but peaceful, having mm. walked through some of those painful places in my life. And I wanted this book, Joe, to be a place of pilgrimage for people, um, a place that you can go, you can retreat into, that you can actually open randomly and pull out some wisdom for your day and consider this a place, a sacred space of pilgrimage. And so um, I would invite people to you know, read it, but also don't be afraid to go back in and just pull out some places and harvest the meaning for you. I think it's the kind of book that, you know, you, you read and then you're going to go back and, and you're going to go back and look and, and you know, s spend time with certain parts of the book that you're, you want to think and go a little further. Let, let's go deeper into this notion of uh, thresholds. So crossing the threshold uh, is the, the name of part two. And you know, what, I, what I like about this is, is that um, crossing a threshold is a sense of motion. You know, you're not just standing still, but you're moving that that there's, you know, everything you talk about in this book is, is a sense of a journey, a sense of moving somewhere. And we talk about crossing thresholds, not just standing on a threshold. So tell us what you're thinking of in, in this uh, second part of the book. And in particular, uh, this notion of, you know, thresholds and doors, you have pictures of, you know, different types mm -hmm. of doors and uh, um, the notion of gatekeepers. So Tell us about part two. I have to tell you, this was the very first line from the book I wrote ever, 20 mm. years ago. Each of us stands at the threshold of a thin place and we are its gatekeeper. And the metaphor that I want to draw on here, by the way, all these pictures that you're seeing are pictures I've taken myself or my family on our journey growing up at home. Mm. Um, and there's this lovely metaphor in Ireland, we call them the half doors, they're very traditional. You can open the whole door, you can open only half the door. You can stand in the door and kind of lean out into the world. And this is this is a threshold moment. I actually worked on this little cottage growing up. Um, I did some building work. I learned how to lime wash and plaster on this cottage. It's about three miles from where I grew up. But they all have these half doors. And I loved this metaphor because we can be very open with God. And that can be a full embracing of the thin place that we're called to. And I'm seeing Deacon Paul in that question bar was asking about that. But also there is there's a, a the, there's a threshold over the doorway, like the bottom of the door where you have to walk through. And that is an act of courage for us to give our heart over to to have courage to find meaning and to step into these threshold places for us. So you can go a little bit at a time. You can keep your door completely closed like a gatekeeper. You can half open or you can completely throw them open. And so these threshold places for us, and we can, we all have them. They can be places of full encounter, or we can close them off to God too, and each other. 
Well, and, and we have a parallel uh, in, in um, uh, our culture, you, uh, American culture at least, that you know, when you get married, uh, the, the groom carries the, his spouse over the threshold. I mean, I literally remember doing that when my wife and I got married almost 40 years ago. Uh, there's this sense of uh, crossing into new space crossing into a new experience. And uh, so throughout this part two, uh, you're really emphasizing a, a lot of the idea of new experiences. And uh, we don't like change a lot in our lives. And yet we're often thrust into uh, such situations of change. We, we are forced across thresholds. Correct. And, you know, uh, Vicky in the chat bar makes an important distinction here. You have, you have to have courage for sure, but you also have to have trust. And trust is the foundation of all relationships. And so, you know, taking that journey into this thin space, when you are often at your lowest point, when you feel like I can't do this anymore, when you are exhausted or tired or overwhelmed or completely heart sick on suffering, I had that experience in my own life. And I remember a good friend of mine, I, I, I just, I walked, I tried to walk out my suffering, walk, walking out these threshold places. And one day I went into a, um, in a church and I realized, you know, many of us have physical aches and pains in life and we can go to the doctor for those or we suffer in other ways and we can receive treatment for them. But when you have a sickness of the soul, when it's deep down in the core of your very being, this soul sickness is a spiritual sickness and we need spiritual remedies for that. And that's one of the great gifts of the wisdom I grew up with, which really talks about the spark, your, your soul is the spark of the divine. Your, your soul is a cavern of eternal memory. It's, we didn't create ourselves. Nobody is the originator of their own existence. I even look at my children sometimes and I'm like, they are, they're very like mom, they're very like dad, but they're completely, they're, they're totally different. And you, you know, as a parent- My way of saying it is, where did these kids come from? <laughs> you have that moment, right, as a parent. And, 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 and that is a threshold moment for us, you know, because our identity is now configured in a different way. And when you, when you see that spark, that spark that's not of you, it's not of your husband, it's really a spark of the divine. And life can enkindle that flame or it can really suck it down to the bare embers. And I wanted to explore how difficult it can be and to encourage you, if you're at that moment where you're thinking, my door is half open or half closed, to just have the courage and trust to just inch your toes across that journey. It really, God will meet you in whatever trust you take and whatever step. Well, and Julianne, that, that notion of the soul sickness uh, really struck me. I was uh, taking a walk the other day uh, outside when it was not below zero here in Chicago. And, and I was thinking about that notion because you and I had just done a rehearsal. And so we got up to that part of soul sickness and then we said, okay, that's enough rehearsal. Uh, and so that was lingering in my head. And, you know, it's something for us to, to ponder about, for us to, to think about, you know, I'm very much in touch with whether I have an ache or pain, or I have a cut on my finger that I have to put a bandage on. Um, but how do we get in touch? How do we get in touch with our soul sickness? I think, you know, uh, it's a great question. And I, at the, the latter part of the book, I talk about some essential practices that can really help nourish your soul in creating this space for grace. And some of them are very simple. They're new twists on gratitude, um, mm. but they're rooted in Celtic practices and wisdom. Um, I think one, I'll give you an example of one that really is a, a bridge or a rainbow between two moments, which is the, the, the difference between stillness and silence. I realized, because I'm quite a robust person, I chat a lot, is I can be in a room that's completely quiet and my mind can be racing and I am not still and at peace. And I think one of the most beautiful understandings that the Celts gave us is this idea of attunement, that silence is not enough. It's good to be quiet, but actually intentionally cultivating quietness and stillness of heart and mind so that we can intentionally listen for God, just like the early Christian church did, the early Christian saints did, that they had very intentional practices around that can allow God to really open us up to these moments when we thought it was raining and all of a sudden there's a rainbow just waiting for us. I love that image of the rainbow. You capture that in some beautiful pictures and, and in your words as well. But that's my village, Joe. Sorry to butt really? in, but Hackestown comes. Oh, it does say that there. Yeah, my village. Yeah, that, wow. That's where I grew up. I just took that picture when I went home in November, actually. 
Oh, that, that's something. I mean, you got the Celtic cross in there too, sure. and the, the the rainbow. So, yeah, the the um, your the words in your book paint pictures. I wish there could have been pictures in your book. You would, that would have been awesome. But your Maybe words that's paint the next pictures. Project, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, Julianne, let's move to part three, mm -hmm. where you talk about this notion of uh, breaking free. Um, and and uh, the quote here is, if you're brave enough to say goodbye, life will reward you with a new hello. Um, you know, it, it's hard to let go of things. I've just been invited to go speak to a parish. We're doing a lot of uh, the churches uh, merging a lot of parishes here in Chicago. And a lot of people are having a hard time letting go of, you know, their old church, their old faith community. Um, why is this an important thing for us to be able to learn to, to let go, to break free? And how is that? Uh, it just seems like a bad thing. When bad things happen, I think sometimes we want to hang on to them. Yeah. And yet yeah. you're suggesting that we need to let go. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of wisdom around this. Um, and the Celts talk about, you know, detachment, but I wanted to make it really simple. I remember when I was a child, I used to go down to a river very close to um, our home. And my grandmother gave me a very, very important lesson one day. And we had a, a storm, we get really, really, like quite a bit of rain in our village at certain times of the year. And it comes down off the mountain and the river start flooding and um, kind of we're used to it, but um, there's like 50 different ways to say it's raining in Irish, by the way. I feel like literally, and it was just one of those days, my grandmother and I went down to the river and my grandmother pointed out that there was a tree and a tree is a very strong, you know, structure and it's rooted, it's, its roots are in the ground. But when the water came, which was fluid, the tree actually snapped and bent over. And my grandmother pointed that out to me and said, now look at the river reeds. Why do they survive after the storm when the tree doesn't? It's because the, the, the reed flexes and bends. And mm. sometimes I think when we have a tendency to hold on too tight, something is going to snap, whether it's our patience or our energy. Um, and I think the, the reed teaches us that mm. it's hard sometimes, but the law of requisite variety teaches us that those who flex and bend actually have the most... Um, uh, resilience in a situation. And one of the things that, that you suggest in uh, part three very strongly is that uh, other people uh, can help us to, to break free. You talk about this notion of, uh, of soul friends, and uh, this just happens to be a, a soul friend of yours, right? Tell us about this notion of a soul friend and how uh, people can, can help us to grow in our faith and help us to grow in our spirituality. Yeah, I, um, I have, I have I've taught a lot about this beautiful concept called the Anamkara, which is the soul friend. And the soul friend and the soulmate are not the same thing. In fact, we've kind of co-opted that understanding of the soulmate to be kind of a romantic notion. And that can be certainly true. But I wanted to recover the dignity of this beautiful understanding because your soul friend is the one that holds the mirror up to you it, it is the it is the ground of, of thin space, just like you had shared, Joe, about your spiritual director um, earlier. And there's this lovely Celtic proverb that says, he, she, and thee, all things in three. And to me, this picture really captures that. This is my husband and I, we were dating at the time, and we took a picture on the cliffs of Moher um, on, in County Clare. And in the back, it looks like clouds, but those are actually the Aran Islands. And to me, this illustrated what the soul friendship is actually calling us to, which is the light of God's grace. And so someone said to me, tell me how you recognize that. I said, your soul, because your soul lives on after you pass, and it is the integrating principle of life, your soul can, can also recognize another soul before you even consciously are aware of it. And so we have these experiences sometimes where we just click with someone and it feels right. And so I wanted to unpack in the book some of these soul friendships, whether they are for a season or whether they are for a lifetime that can help us break free of attachments or patterns in our life that aren't healthy. And, you know, I, I think it, uh, once again, it also makes us think about, you know, how can I be a soul friend to someone else? You know, am I just uh, hanging around with people for fun or am I just, you know, gossiping with people or is there someone that I can really, you know, be there to listen to? Pope Francis talks about accompaniment. 
and how important this is in our lives to, to be soul friends to one another. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, soul friends, you know, my, my, my grandmother said this to me, too, and I know I'm talking about a lot of her today. She's on my heart. She, she often would share with me that, you know, it's sometimes when it comes to ourselves, we can't see, um, we can't see ourselves as clearly as God sees us, obviously. And she, she'd give me this analogy. She'd go like this. And she'd say, you can't read a book when the words are this close mm. to your face. Soul friends encourage us to step back so that we can become sacred ground for the thin space of another. And so I love this co concept of the Anamkara. It's been with me through my entire life. And um, I've been lucky to have soul friends. I had one, his name was Owen Cassidy. He passed into eternal life last year. I can still feel his presence upon me. And I know that he is blessing me every day. And the, that is a thin space for us. And I, this gets to this next piece, Joe, that we've talked about quite a bit, which is storytelling. And um, there's a wonderful expression in Ireland where if you are, you know, for slang, um, street, street talk is slang. Okay. Right? Um, but if you meet someone on the streets of Dublin, uh, they'll often go story bud, like they're saying, what's the story buddy? Oh, okay. And I realized when I took a group to Ireland, people say story bud. And they were like, what are they saying? There's a lovely Irish expression that comes from, which is cod a on scale a god, which literally means what story is upon you? So mm. rather than saying, how you doing? It's a story. Like, what's the story? And yeah. I wanted to tap into that a little bit through the lens of storytelling as a, as a ground of thin space. And, and so, the, yeah, we, you and I have talked about this many times, but you deal with this in the book as, as well, encouraging people to, to get in touch with their story. And a lot of times I think people respond by saying, what do you mean story? I don't have a story. You know, so what, what's at the heart of people's story? How do you get people to begin recognizing that they have a story? I was the same. I thought I didn't have a story. And in fact, I wrote this book and I stopped right before, right around chapter eight. And if you've read the book to get to chapter nine, oh, that ripped my heart out in so many ways. It's the story of my mother's passing. And I mm. sent it to Joe actually here on the call and said, please tell me what you think, because our stories are so personal and so meaningful to us. And thankfully, Joe said, keep going. Don't stop sharing. So I would say to a lot of people, recognize one, that you don't just have a story. You are a story. Mm -hmm. Your life is being written in these thin space moments. And then I would say to you, have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever lost someone you loved? Have you ever been moved to tears by a beautiful sunrise or sunset? Set? You have a story. We all have stories because we are at heart storytellers. When we dream at night, night is just story without us talking. It's our imaginations wandering. And so I, I really want to encourage people to see their lives as story. And those are, are really powerful prompts that you sell, uh, share with people as well for how to get, in, get into your story. Let's move on to part four because we want to get to some Q&A. Yeah. So folks, if you have questions or insights, uh, go to chat right now. We're about five minutes away from jumping into some Q&A uh, with Julianne. But uh, we do want to wrap things up uh, with part four, which is actually coming full circle. And there's a... a uh, another uh, Irish or I should say Gaelic phrase there, I'm not even going to try. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what you have on the screen here and uh, what it means about uh, being a storyteller. It's ma an scaly an einscher, which is time is a good storyteller. When we look back at places in our life with grace, with um, the gift of hindsight, but also the gift of recognizing where God has journeyed with us, carried us in these thin spaces, we often see that we come full circle. And um, circles were very important in the life of the um, early Christian people. And so this is actually a, a wood carving. If you ever go to Waterford, which is in the southeast of Ireland, um, you'll see what's called the Triskelion, which is the triple spiral. And this was the cycle of life, uh, the unending circle of life before life, uh, before things can be fertile and then the, the ground is fertile and then things die off, you know, the seasons of life. When St. Patrick encountered these Triskelion circles everywhere, like on the tombs of Newgrange, he baptized these for the Irish as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the unending circle of life and love in, in Jesus Christ. And so you'll see these circles. I have my sweater on today. You can't see it, but I have some circles on the sleeves and things. 
and the Triskelion has huge meaning. So we sometimes will find that we'll come back to the beginning of our story, to, especially when we are asking those deeper questions, and we'll realize our endings and our beginnings ebb and flow into one another. Well, and I have to tell you, as I was pondering this uh, chapter the other day, I couldn't help but think of uh, a pop song from, I don't know, maybe 15, even 20 years ago by a group called the Semisonic. The song is called Closing Time. Oh, yeah. And it has a phrase, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. I think you could have written that, Julianne. Maybe you should check with the group and get some royalties on that. So the endings and beginnings are, are deeply connected. And in this Celtic spirituality, life is, is circular. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more about this notion. Yeah, you know, I think one of the greatest ways that we experience this is actually in the mystery of being born and dying. And so light and darkness are the bookends of all time. So you think about expecting a baby and the child grows in the darkness of the womb. Like light is a necessary condition for life and yet the child grows in the darkness and then the passages from the darkness into the light. And then when someone is passing away back into eternal life, we see this circle, the circle coming round here and we see that the light that we live in has dimmed as that person goes into this eternal darkness, which is actually the beginning of eternal light for them. And so I wanted to kind of wrap around this understanding of these stone circles. And, you know, Stonehenge is, is one of those circles. Yeah. One of my favorites is in the south of Ireland, the county called Cork called Stonebeg. And when you, when you journey into these places, they help you really look at places in your life that you thought were endings, but were actually beginnings and vice versa. Um, you can see, again, the triple spirals here and the quadruple spirals um, on the scroll work here as you look up into the, the round towers. So Celtic art, mythology actually has a resonance with a lot of different cultures. I saw in the chat bar, there was a lovely comment from someone in Hawaii who said, talk story is a very Hawaiian um, invitation to kind of exchange life. And um, I, I think that there's a lot of resonance with some of these traditions and we've forgotten them. Well, Julianne, I want to uh, close on this note, which I think is so very important, which you, you talk a lot uh, near the end about this the profound notion of hospitality in uh, Celtic spirituality. And, uh, you know, you started off with a thousand welcomes, a hundred thousand welcomes, right? Yeah. Um, tell us more about this notion of uh, hospitality and, you know, how any uh, pilgrimage uh, to, to Ireland must include a pub. What's Absolutely. that all about? You know, the Irish culture is a very, very social culture. And people think it's because we're nice to people and we banter about nice things, but actually it's not. We take the time to really discuss some really difficult things um, because that's what connects us, you know? And today I think conversation is fraught with all kinds of landmines, but this understanding of hospitality flows from the virtue of recognizing that, that each person is sacred and has dignity and worth. And that how we treat people is a reflection, in fact, of how we may be treated by Jesus Christ himself. And so this I, a lovely Irish expression, Cade Mila Falcha, which means a hundred thousand welcomes, um, kind of leads you to this understanding of there's always room for one more at the table. And I was in Ireland, um, in Glendalough, and there's a really, really famous pub very close to there called Glenmalure Lodge. And I came in with my son. So do you mind going back to that picture one more time? Oh, sure. I want to show you. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. Like, that's my youngest son. Oh, um, okay. The bartender that was there was like, oh, look at this wee little Irish lad. And I was like, well, <laughs> in America. Oh, wonderful. We love Americans. Grabbed him, took him up into her arm. She was bartending with him in one arm, and he had a little sucker in the other. <laughs> um, but I love this idea of this circle of life to include and welcome and invite and really warm hearts. Um, especially at times that um, are more difficult for us. And that's one of the great gifts I think that the Irish culture has given the world, this beautiful hospitality. Well, and I can't wait for COVID to be over, Julianne, so we can get together again and find a, a pub and, and raise a glass and say slancha, all right? I would love that, Joel. That would be wonderful. We have time for some uh, Q&A with, uh, with Julianne. And... Um, Julianne, are, are you uh, looking at the chat yourself or do you yeah. want me to feed anything to you? Uh, it's up to you. Yeah, there's. I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing a lot coming in here as well. A um, couple of things. Um, some people are saying, can they save the chat? And you should be able to save it. If you can't, we'll collect all of the chat. And we'll make sure that some sort of transcript goes out on that. There was a couple of comments that came in about, I want to do this with my book club. 
Um, and the, so they asked, is there a reader's guide and a facilitator's guide? Yes, there is. Um, on the LoyolaPress.com website, if you search for Start With Jesus, um, pardon me, not Start With Jesus, for Braving the Thin Places, there's a little um, tab that says Extras. And if you go there, you can actually download uh, for free all of the things that you need to run your book club with some of the backstory around some of the chapters in the book as well. Julianne, I, I see a comment from Karen says, there's an Irish pub that I passed by on my way to work called The Half Door. Now I know why it's named that. There you go. How about that? That's something. What yeah. else, folks? Do you have any questions for Julianne? Go ahead and, and put them in. We're just scanning through. There's lots of thank yous, of course. Um, Will there, be, will there be a Kindle version of the book? I think that usually happens, right, Julianne? Yeah, there's actually, um, there's an audio, um, the book is being recorded on audio right now um, as well. So there's, there, there will be an audio book, there's a Kindle version of the book, and there's a regular copy of the book, because I love the smell of the book. Um, okay. So I'm getting a, a question in here as well around, can, can thin spaces be places like churches? or can they be outside in nature? And I think the answer is both. Um, so I just wanted to, to uh, affirm that Tara asked that question and uh, let her know that I answered that one. And then Good, here's, here's a question um, oh, or a thought. Elizabeth uh, says, I would love to hear the words of some of the blessings to which you referred on doing household chores. So I'll give you a good one. It's in English, but one of my favorite is a mealtime blessing. It's God bless the food, God bless the drink, God bless the human race, God bless the hands that make our food, all homes and hearts, oh God embrace. So there's these lovely blessings that pepper your day, you know, may the God of abundant surprises be with you. But people had blessings throughout their day to kindle the fire, to, to um, douse the fire in the evening. Um, and so I've included some of those actually uh, throughout the book as well. And so a lot of Celtic spirituality is very homey then, correct? Very domestic? Yeah, we talk about like the heart of the home, but also your soul is the hearth of your person. It's that which burns. And so that is a place of warmth. That is a place of encouragement and hospitality. And I love that you said it's a homey place because I think it is. It's a place where you can sit down, bring your whole self to and have a good cup of tea with someone or a pint of Guinness. Wonderful. Anything else jumping out at you, Julianne? I'm scanning myself. Yeah, um, um, is so there a anything? Asking, here's um, a question from Emma. Is there anything one can do to make space for a thin place in my church or parish if I feel it is a closed space? Well, that's a great question. And I think, again, being attuned to what's happening is important. Your person can be a thin space for others. Um, again, remember, you have that capacity to, to provide an open space. And certainly, yes, you can create that. My office is a thin space. I have places here that are touchstones for me. I have blankets that people can curl up with. You can have portable thin space. It doesn't have to be fixed. So um, I would say that would be um, so a challenge. But I, I bet because of the question that you just asked, you're more than up to the task there. So, and I think I've, I've, um, I remember commenting on this once before when we talk about uh, thin spaces, thin moments, that you know, all of us need to work at being thinner. And I'm not talking about our physical weight. That, that uh, when we, when people encounter us, are they able to to see through us to see uh, the face of God? Um, and so, I think thinness is something for all of us to strive for. Would that be a good point to, for us to wrap up on, Julian? It would. It would be a great one. I would say recognize that you are a blessing, that your life is to be a blessing. The word Gaelic in Irish is banachti, and that is my wish for you, is that you be a blessing, that you walk out your blessing with others. I know there was a lot of questions here, too, um, that I can, we can grab the, all those up. Real quick one, Joe, someone asked, do you think the book would be um, a good one for an interfaith group to read? I would say yes. Um, I have a few friends that I've read it um, from various different backgrounds. My neighbor is also Lutheran, and he came to me with a book in his hand two nights ago saying, this, this is really good. <laughs> I love it. Um, so that was really good. Um, and there's a couple of questions around um, Celtic high points of the year, like All Hallows Eve or the Feast of Sound for the Celts and how we celebrate those. So there's a lot of different information that you can find in there as well. 
Well, Julianne, we can't thank you enough for the, the beautiful sharing that you did in this webinar, and especially in your book. I encourage people to, to get a hold of the book, get your friends to get a hold of it. You can uh, uh, acquire it in a number of ways. I have the QR code on the screen here once again. If you want to scan that, you can go to store.loyolapress.com. You can call 800-621-1008, which is Loyola Press Customer Service, where you'll talk to a human being five days a week. Uh, we're going to be doing a Lenten read-along with Julianne's book beginning on Ash Wednesday, March 2nd. Uh, and uh, people will be using the hashtag, uh, hashtag Lent read along. So pay attention to news about that. And also a recording of this um, webinar will be available uh, soon, maybe within a day or two, at ignatianspirituality.com. Uh, so, Julianne, I want to give you a chance to give us one more uh, Gaelic lesson. I think you had a farewell in mind, didn't you, for uh, thanking people? So, the way that we um, say hello to each other in Ireland is also a very good way to say goodbye, the beginning and the end, which is dia guit. And, Joe, I'm going to teach you this. The response is dia is muera dit. Can you say that? Dia. I'll say it again a little louder. Dia is muera dit. I'm not going to try. I'm so God. sorry. It's okay. Dia is muera which is God and near you. One more time. Dia grit. Say it. Say it three three parts real slowly. Dia. Dia. Grit. Grit. Very good. Which is God be with you. And then I'll God say, be God, with you. God be with you. And I'll say, Garavmila Mahagut. You don't have to repeat, repeat that, Joe, which is a hundred thousand thank yous for being with you. A hundred thousand thank yous. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Julianne. A hundred thousand thank yous back at you. And thank you to everyone for, for joining us. And may God bless you. And may you find thin places everywhere you look in your life. Thank you and God bless.